the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about Jesus spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon theme for today is brought to remembrance. We pray, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be you are rock and redeemer. Amen. What a sharp contrast there is between the first lesson of last week, where, if you remember, the widow is saying, as the prophet Elijah arrives to her house, will you be hospitable to me? Well, yes, but... Uh, what I'm really doing is picking up these sticks because I'm going to make one last fire to cook some bread mixed with the very humble ingredients of oil and flour, that's all, for which after we've had our last morsel we plan to perish and die. Whether that's them being so weak they're simply going to sit in their house and wait for starvation to finally take them, or what? Two. Jumping to this week's text, O oh, man of God, have you come here to cause us to die? The very man who provided the miracle from the mouth of God, you shall surely not die. First give me something to eat. And as surely as the Lord lives, your oil and flour will not run dry. Saving them from starvation. O oh man of God, have you come here to kill us? What I find interesting is coupled with that, excuse me, with that phrase, you have brought to remembrance our sin. For that is correct. The ultimate consequence of sin, death, reminding us of the rawness what sin is and what it brings, death. And expectedly so. That's what we expect. But does God bring this? We bring this. How quick she was to change suddenly. With a little bit of blessing, ironically. It's perhaps a warning to us as well. Do we expect blessing after blessing after blessing? Because God has acted mercifully toward us. They were going to die in that first instance. And because she had come to terms with that, she had accepted that. She was gathering her last sticks for one last meal to die. Not necessarily blaming any, anyone. That, that was the way it was. She knew she was a sinner. She was a Gentile. Her whole household being blessed by God, and then saying, well, did you come just to remind us of our sin before we die? Well, that would be the right way to do it. But just so you know, that not only is God, the Lord Yahweh, so merciful that he will give you bread when you're hungry, satisfied with 
death having the last word. And so this man of God, of course, does what is in his power according to faith and his purpose there, and he raises the widow's son to life. Just as Jesus in the Gospel lesson last week describes the goodness of the Creator and providing not only bread but clothing to the flowers of the field and the grass, to feeding the birds. Jesus in the Gospel reading today, in person, God incarnate, comes across this parade, this funeral procession. And you really get the impression the whole town is with them. There's a great crowd from the village. But when you come across Jesus, sickness, death, you are stopped in your tracks. He stops the whole thing. And he says, don't weep. Because the law of life is here. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says in the Gospel according to John. So yes, he stops that procession. And he puts his hand up to the beard. And he says to the child, Rise. Arise. Because he is the one who will rise from the dead. With all certainty and confidence that going to the cross and suffering for us, not simply dying, suffering for us and dying, he will rise from the dead three days later, thereby granting resurrection to all, even acknowledging the power of the prophets sent by God from every generation previous and after, right, through the apostles as well. But he is the one who has granted that power. He is the source. He is the resurrection. So everyone who uses that language, rise, is using it in the name of Jesus. Powerful stuff. So much so, you might ask the question in terms of application, how does this apply to me? How am I raised? In multiple ways, really. And in many contexts, the day of resurrection, the last day, the day of judgment even, where he judges you and his sentence is right. For Jesus has already applied his promise of salvation to you today. You will rise. As surely as that promise is ours today, as we look back to our baptism and say Christ has raised me. He has given me a new spirit for today. The last couple of weeks we've been going through the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Because it is the fruit of the spirit in you. From you. Because Christ has raised you now. In your baptism. Dare I say, he even raised the thief on the cross when he said, Today you will see me in paradise. Do not worry, your sins are forgiven. You will see me in paradise. He raises the thief from the cross by his word, by the power of his word, the same word that said, Let there be light. And I feed the birds of the air and clothe the flowers of the field. <clears throat> I put a garment <coughs> of righteousness upon you. And I have raised you to be a new creation in me. I like going to Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 I believe is the tax collector's conversion. And he says to Matthew, follow me. And the script doesn't simply say, the narrative doesn't simply say, and he followed him. This is a life-changing event. In this context, St. Matthew is raised 
It says, and he rose and followed him by his word. Can you imagine? Of course we have today. Baptism is the one thing we need and is passed down as part of the Great Commission because Jesus isn't here exactly like he was there face to face with St. Matthew even if it is but a mask of God himself. We need this because he attaches his promise to this, to water and his word. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mine. But he raises Matthew in order to follow him. He leaves everything behind, right, like Zacchaeus. Probably ends up paying back all the people he's frauded. Because it's our nature. He chooses even the weak and the simple to be disciples. They're not perfect people. That's not why he chooses them. Follow me. From the word of Jesus himself, God incarnate. He is raised to follow him. He changes his life. He's no longer a tax collector. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's going to leave everything to follow him. Maybe even sell his house. Buy a tent. So he can pitch it up wherever Jesus is. And we're not told that strictly in the text. Too far. It's not uh, an instruction manual for what you must do. I'm not saying sell your house and your possessions, your home, your livelihood. Nothing which we're going to confess the will of God. One does not envy that in the ninth and tenth commandments of anyone. It helps one to uphold his property and livelihood. Yes, for the good of the kingdom of God. Outreach, evangelism, for the spreading of that which will raise others to life. We contribute to that. But who else does God use? Those He calls, those He raises, those who He addresses, follow me, and we say, Oh, I'll look for someone to follow me. I'll follow you. Who shall we send? Lord, send me. And as much as I'd like to elaborate on the epistle lesson, some epistles cannot be elaborated on. They're so beautifully simple that they must simply be repeated. And our epistle lesson is talking then of the grace of the Spirit that does necessarily work through us performatively as Christians, we have grasped the gospel to quote from verses 14 to 19. Having grasped that we are raised in Christ, the same God who raised every person in the mercy, Old Testament to be speaking, and who has revealed himself, masked in the, the body of Jesus, who in the face of death won't let it walk by. He must stop it and say, be raised. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Right? Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 20. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, your whole being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I can't say it any better. That was our epistle lesson, epistle lesson Ephesians chapter. Even when I try to expand it, I'm messing up. Right? In Christ, we are raised. Hear his word of admonition. Even the description of the fruits of the Spirit. And be raised. In the name and for the sake of Jesus. Because he is already risen for you. Amen. 
May the peace which surpasses our understanding keep your hearts and minds in God.